Hello, and most welcome to Heidegger 17.52 of the series. We will continue today with the previous reading of Captivating Pictures by Stephen G. Affelt. And we have been talking about an underlying picture that captivates our intelligence. One important feature of the thinking of Wittgenstein is that he goes into our most how can you say, everyday experiences. When uh, we looked at Paul Johnston and Joachim Schulte and Paul Livingstone, we went deep into what thinking is. And one of those questions in Paul Johnston was is thinking an inner speech or is it a sort of image these questions might seem very how can you say a bit too every day for normal philosophy but in many subjects they have a remarkable important influence and it's interesting when the book was written by Paul Johnston artificial intelligence was still in its cradle Here we have a good one on page 257, I think it is. Wittgenstein's claim at paragraph 109 that philosophy is a battle against the bewitchment of our intelligence by means of language. Here it's indicated that it is something both in our language and in other cases, it's also clearly indicated that there is a sort of picture. But I would say that is not a picture in the normal sense. I thought about this yesterday when preparing for this lecture and since we didn't have a summary lost I think the example of thinking could be helpful for you to sort of get into the zest of it If you get the picture that thinking is inner speech, chat GTP will be very, will be just around the corner. It's the explicit talking that in this example gets confused with thinking. And one one say, talking, it is always something that is expressed. There's another good site. He remarks that our forms of expression prevent us 
in all sorts of ways from seeing that nothing out of the ordinary is involved by sending us in pursuit of chimeras. And the chimera here is that thinking is expressed talk, words, writings, transferable to a computer, collected by the chat GTP or something similar. A sort of calculation will happen inside of our container. There you have another part of the picture that our minds are a sort of a container for things. And out will come new thinking, only understandable by ourselves with a private language. And there you have yet another little part of the picture. So although it might seem of very little importance whether we think thinking is inner speech or image, these are the things that builds up our judgments and lead us in pursuits of chimeras. Sedmak and Locker, which we took up in lecture 1750, shows that those very misunderstandings leads us into the path of the passive or region seeking. Christianity, cut off from practice and making the concepts empty, making them mean less. making free will disappear from the, the view. Because if thinking is words, are words, then by extension, everything will happen in that pattern, which is the collection of all your thoughts, and you will have determinism in the same way that chat GTP is the collection of all words, all the words in the world, all books that's been digitalized. So its thinking will be predetermined a priori by the words that are already expressed. So these are not small consequences at all on the contrary, they are decisive for what happens in all the other sciences. We mentioned previously how this thinking of thinking as words or small objects led to the fixatedness 
of Francois Jacob and Bernard and Kengelheim, Jacques Monod, not forgetting Richard Dawkins, of course. The mistake is already in our ordinary language. It's already established somewhere. And by using the finest forms of our intelligence, we get tricked into following the wrong paths that really leads us into confusion, embitterment, and disaster, I'd say. These are not small things in the end. I'd say that there is a picture behind and these confusions are the cause of the current situation in religion in the West. Since free will does not exist, how could God or a soul exist? And if we are only automatas, then we don't have even morality or any ethics to us. We will be literally damned. Another such helper could be the chapter of perception in Paul Johnston. The idea that perception happens within the container and it's coming from the outside. The camera oscura that we earlier also mentioned from Paul Feyerabend lights of ray are impinging on our eyes and they are creating experience from a world we can only indirectly understand. And then we can name the things that we are experience in that outside world. It would be as we are visitors from an alien planet to Earth, that we have nothing at all to do with this. And in the end, that all the words, concepts, our constructions in our inner private language are completely arbitrary. So as you see, those are not small consequences by a long shot. <coughs> And then later up, when the mistakes are already established to try to convince people that they have a free will, will not work. We need to go back to the actual misuse, the misplacement, where it is situated and so to speak, nip it in the bud.
This is the reason that Paul Johnston's book, which I highly recommend, is a primer on the most important tools for going further into Wittgenstein. The act of thinking, perception, our emotions, the idea that there are automaticated reactions to the outside leads to the enclosedness of the container that we are in the end shut off from the world which of course led to the putnamian reign in the that Zudu problem and of course many other Zudu problems memory was also chapter 4 I think is also influenced and created by the picture You see how they are connected. In this case, memory is something separate. It's a process of register, registering what's happening, happening outside of us. And those memory bits get stored away in our memory bank which effectively makes us into computers. So we become analyzing machines that calculate the content of our memory and the result will be predetermined deterministic coming to the result, which is the sum of all the engravings. It's dehumanizing, but it's also absolutely wrong. So there are some hints how the picture work. We can now continue. Well, we have a summary I promised in the last session. We will now continue with the read of the text, I hope. This gave you some first taste of how the picture can evolve. I often compare it to imagine there are several people in a room with blindfolds. And each of them are holding one part of an elephant. One has the tail and another has a grip on its tusks and one of its trunks, of its trunk. So the different Instrument tools are equivalent to the tusk and the trunk and the legs. So together, they will help to get a picture of the elephant slash the behind picture. Little by little, it becomes clearer. And once it is sufficiently clear, you will no longer 
be under its rule. You will be liberated from it. You can decide for yourself of your thinking and you will be truly free. So I hope that enticed you and we continue. It's the last paragraph on page 258 of the written edition. If one adopts this first reading of Wittgenstein's remark, it will be clear, at least in outline, what it means to say that our intelligence is bewitched and how philosophy may battle against that bewitchment. To say that our intelligence is bewitched will be to say that in philosophy we are led into error and confusion by our ordinary language, by our reliance upon superficial features of our forms of expression and by our failure adequately to understand the workings of our language. Philosophy will battle against this bewitchment by showing that we fail to understand our ordinary language. <coughs> that we have an inadequate view of its workings and by providing us with a more complete and nuanced appreciation of the details of the workings of our language. Once those details have been provided, our philosophical errors and confusions will be dissolved and we will be released from the bewitchment of our intelligence. Further, if one adopts this reading of Wittgenstein's remark, the character of any redemptive project which it supports will be circumscribed, clear and hopeful. It will be circumscribed in being <coughs> directed specifically toward releasing those engaged in 
certain forms of philosophical thought from the obscurities into which they are led by the failure of adequately to understand the workings of our language. It will be clear in that, since the source of our bewitchments <laughs> is understood to lie in the failure properly to understand the details of the workings of our language, the liberating dimension of Wittgenstein's work will lodge simply in its enrichment of our understanding. Nothing further will be required. Finally, it will be hopeful in that of this reading, we are permitted to imagine that we may eventually command a completely clear and comprehensive view of the workings of our language as a whole. At this, at that point, we will be finally and fully free of all philosophical confusion and our intelligence will be finally and fully free of the threat of bewitchment. If one adopts the second reading of Wittgenstein's remark, matters are not so clear, circumscribed, or hopeful. It will not be clear what it means to say that our intelligence is bewitched and how it comes to be bewitched. Accordingly, it will not be clear whether this malady is reserved exclusively for those engaged in philosophical thought. It will be equally unclear what it means to say that philosophy by means of language may battle this bewitchment and how it is to do so. Finally, since it is not clear how our intelligence is bewitched or how philosophy battles 
this bewitchment, it will not be clear that there is any prospect of arriving at a full and final release from this bewitchment. Take it up a bit. Given these consequences of adopting this second reading, it may well seem that there is nothing to recommend it. However, it is this reading of Wittgenstein's remark that informs my effort here to begin articulating what I understand to be the morally redemptive work of philosophical investigations. My reasons for adopting this second reading over the first are primarily the following. First, notwithstanding some of the apparent evidence to the contrary, which I have noted, I think that Wittgenstein does not maintain that our ordinary language contains traps simply lying within it which bewitch our intelligence. Rather, Wittgenstein is concerned to understand how and why we are led to distort our ordinary language and our relation to it. Two, in this way, make our language a scene of traps for our intelligence. And then to project the cause of the bewitchment of our intelligence back into language and to maintain that it already contained traps lying within it. Throughout the investigations, that is, Wittgenstein is concerned to highlight and to treat different expressions of what his work shows to be a fundamental human drive to bewitch our own intelligence, which it manifests
in our relation to our language. This fundamental human drive to bewitch our own intelligence, or as Wittgenstein says at paragraph 109, a drive to misunderstand is both re revealing and expressed in the insistent, often desperate emptiness and confusion that Wittgenstein recurrently encounters in the interlocutory voices of the text. A little glitch here. Let's continue. Second, insofar as Wittgenstein is concerned to bring out a fundamental human drive to misunderstand or to bewitch our own intelligence, the burden of his redemptive work will not lie in simply providing understanding and philosophy as he practices it, will not battle the bewitchment of our intelligence primarily provided providing us with a more complete understanding of the workings of our language Rather, Wittgenstein's philosophical practice will work to battle the bewitchment of our intelligence by seeking to discover and to combat the various sources of our drive to misunderstand and to distort our language and our relation to it. Wittgenstein's redemptive work is not directed in the first instance toward philosophical difficulties, difficulties themselves, but toward uncovering and treating the multiple and diverse human fantasies, cravings, dissatisfactions, and the like which lie behind the first steps into philosophical confusion, emptiness, fixation, insistence, and the like. Further, insofar 
as Wittgenstein shows specific forms of philosophical confusion and emptiness to express forms of fundamental human drive to misunderstand. He also reveals the ubiquity and even in one sense, the naturalness of philosophical confusion and emptiness to the human being upon stopping to take thought or to reflect. And I think I will stop mid-paragraph this time because the ending here was so good. Put a little mark there on reflect. Reflect. Also, footnote on reflect there and find it. Number 10, let's see what he said. The thoughts in the previous two sentences are directly indebted to Warren Goldfarb's important essay, I want you to bring me a slab. In this essay, Goldfarb powerfully argues that throughout the investigations, Wittgenstein is not concerned to directly contest fully articulated philosophical problems and theories, but rather to reveal the apparent naturalness of the first moves of thought that led to the development of more fully articulated philosophical problems and theories, and to contest these first moves. And this thank, thankfully goes back to what I said introductory. We need to go back before the problems are articulated and there to contest these first two moves. That is one of the reasons why Paul Johnston, Joachim Hulte are going down to the grits. Really, before it starts and shows the lure here, why it is so tempting to make the conclusions we do. I think haste is not the only thing it is actually temptation. If we go to page, if we go please to page 258, Colin.
That's the very down. You say that our intelligence is bewitched is to say that in philosophy we are led into error and confusion by our ordinary language, by our reliance upon superficial features of our forms of expression and by our failure adequately to understand the workings of our language. It's the superficial structures. We mentioned those before in Ohad Nachtomi. And it's the idea that you think, for instance, that the soul is an object of its superficial working in a sentence as an object taker. It also takes an indefinite marker, one or a soul, and a definite marker in the soul. So we can then compare it to a table, which is more or less what Plato did. And then after that, there is no solution. This is this emptiness, stark emptiness that Arthur mentioned. Go over to the next page. And at the very bottom there, Arfeld is in the view, which we can contest when we discuss, or better, maybe next time, or the very last paragraph. First, notwithstanding some of the apparent evidence to the contrary, which I have noted. I think that Wittgenstein does not maintain that our ordinary language contains traps simply lying with it, which bewitch our intelligence. Rather, Wittgenstein is concerned to understand how and why, listen now, why we are led to distort our ordinary language and our relation to it. To, in this way, make our language a scene of traps for our intelligence and then to project the course of the bewitchment of intelligence back to language and maintain that it already contained traps lying with it. I mean, that's a very important point. It's a double take here. It's both the intelligence and things in language that could be almost like traps. I think you start getting, you're starting to getting a grip here how incredibly serious this is, what the consequences could be if our very language get fundled. And on the next page to the very end, in the second paragraph.
about 12 lines down, we find Wittgenstein's redemptive work is not directed in the first instance toward philosophical difficulties themselves, but toward uncovering and treating the multiple and diverse human fantasies, cravings, dissatisfactions, and the like, which lie behind the first steps into philosophical confusion, emptiness, fixation, insistence, and the like. I would say this is showing why we left when we left the right hemisphere and forced ourselves into the left hemisphere of confusion and misunderstanding. I felt this showing that Wittgenstein is doing something much beyond solving philosophical knots. much more and i think it's a picture behind the secularization there's a picture behind <clears throat> the left hemisphere gain and these days of emptiness fixation insistence stiff nakedness the closing, nothing less than the closing of the Western mind. My first take on this is I, I, I feel sympathetic to the ideas of Affeltir. And uh, I will ask Paul Johnston, but I have a hunch that he would agree because once your everyday life is already confused isn't that more grave than the philosophical problems that comes later this is not me saying that the philosophical problems are completely uninteresting but everyday life the survival your faith your point of life, we all know that those things has gone out of the window. Could it be, as Arthur suggests, that we do not have to do this? It's, it's not caused by the modern times. It has a different reason, and therefore it can be in some way treated or taken care of. So that was, I felt, Kalle, let's hear it from you, my dear colleague. Thank you. Let's go to page 257. It was in the previous lecture, but it's I felt it's doing a commentary on this very phase, so I think it's the uh, most important uh, of this whole paper, perhaps, or at least in this part, since I felt it's explicitly co commenting on this paragraph 109 in Philosophical Investigations. Philosophy is a battle against the development of our intelligence by means of language. So, uh, I think here, this phrase, the last uh, third verse, by means of language, uh, it would, Wittgenstein would have made it more easy for us if he would have placed these four words, let's say, here, philosophy is a pattern by means of language against the development of our intelligence. Hmm. Yeah, I see your point. So, so for me, so language is 
Okay. Um, it depends. Um, English has relatively strict rules for uh, word order. For me, of language, I don't know. Um, do you get my point? Um, yeah, and... I get your point, but I don't want to miss anything of the valuable stuff you're saying. Can you? Uh, keep your tone down a bit or go down a little bit and speak a bit deeper so uh, mm. the microphone would catch what you say. Please, Kale. Yes, let me repeat. This is so important. Philosophy is a battle against the punishment of uh, intelligence by means of language. Wittgenstein would have made it easier for us if he had placed these for concluding verse in a different place, say, after the word battle, that is, philosophy is a battle by means of language against the development of our intelligence. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. That would have been better. So here, with the case of ambiguous, is language a friend? Or is an enemy, so to say. Um, so, is it possible, Hans? English is not my native, native language, so um, to say that Pamir's language um, could it be understood in this sense you place it after the battle? Because it's a battle. Uh, does it also, can you understand it? It's about the Pamir's language. Can you answer it in that way as well? Yes, yes, I can. And I need I need to also, of course, comment that I am not an uh, English speaker by birth. But to me, yes, I would say that. And uh, if you allow me to give a comment on you, whether language is enemy or friend, it's a bit both here. It's, uh, I think language is our best friend, but we have treated her badly. That could be something that Ethel is pointing to. Curing language, so it once, once more will be massive and uh, filled up. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's possible to say that uh, by means of language is entangled with the whole place. So it's both philosophy, it's a part of by means of language, I guess the investment of our intelligence, but it's also philosophy, it's a part of like the investment of our intelligence. By means of language, so to say, it's independent of how we put the emphasis. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, so, uh, so if you think that language is an enemy, yeah, so you put, um, I don't know, uh, then, then you emphasize, I don't know, and it's difficult to explain this, but I, don't, I think you get my point. Mm, um, yeah. Yes, I get your point. And we also need to know uh, battle is a bit strong here. Uh, but uh, but uh, I, I do get Wittgenstein's point as well. Battle is a bit strong. <laughs> Uh, but the understanding is always helpful. Every little part I understood has been helping me in some way. So it's clearing out uh, misunderstandings is always good. Mm. So, uh, so if I can propose a question to uh, Dr. Paul Livingstone. So question to him would be, uh, is Spanish or language Ambiguous. Uh, is it placed intentionally ambiguously in the, at the end of the phrase? Um, or oh, how would I put it? Um, mm, you're more than welcome to come back with a written email or something to clear it out when you have time. I'll send it to him. Mm -hmm. We have been in correspondence a couple of times, and he answers quite extensively on my questions. Mm -hmm. 
but I'm, um, <laughs> I, as, uh, I guess that we'll get us in the uh, English mom because here. Come again, Kale? Uh, I, I guess Wittgenstein's international ambiguous here. Yes, yes, there's oh. good reason to think that. Um, hmm. So, uh, and I think that often here, yeah, uh, especially, but he makes two interpretations. Uh, the first one is language is the means of bewitchment of our intelligence. In which the is this uh, um, So this is the negative view of language, of course. And then the call to the second proposition, which is this is the battle by means of language. Ah, uh, here we have it actually. There you have it. Ah, yes, yeah. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> okay. So, so, so uh, uh, <laughs> I'm asking a question that uh, affects, it's only that I, um, I came to this hmm, from, uh, uh, after this formal uh, differently, but I think we have the same view. Uh, uh, but Mitchell Lange, C, C, and C here, um, for him, he has, if the means, Lange, if the means, of the bewitchment of a, um, or is it cause of the means? Language is an enemy, here, and it's a friend. Because the other means language, I guess, to be more in this Yeah, you got your answers answer already in the text. Isn't that great? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so it's a, a standard uh, means of the means language with the whole case. Um, so, and uh, after the himself, he prefers the second solution. And the second solution is more in line with Heidegger, because he thinks Heidegger thinks that rather, okay, Heidegger uh, has it both face. Ordinary language is a problem, but it will be can lead you to find the true essence of things. Uh, yeah. Heidegger has no fallacy. For the, past, for the past, for the past, that is it. Uh, English is free, so English is German, etc., etc. Et et Go back to the language when it was still not misused, so to speak, when it was healed. <laughs> so, I think it's very nostalgic, and probably also naive to think that language was better once upon a time. Mm, it was it was not as affected by the malady of uh, the confusion uh, previously. I think that Ian McKinquist is of a similar uh, similar view. Um, I do not know though um, what Wittgenstein um, would think of that. That's another. And um, oh, let me finally only. Comment on Warren that you that we mentioned him in footnote 10. Uh, you remember Warren footnote 10? I don't know if you know this scholar. Uh, mentioned, uh, Number 10 it was in the footnote. Now let me see. It could be very interesting to go through that paper. Oh. Yeah, I already decided to do that. Thanks. <laughs> ah, he's actually going strong. Uh, so this is called up. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He has coordinated good scholarly works. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not too bad. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Oh, well, um, let's go back to Alfred. And perhaps you should uh, stop there, Hans. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kali, for. It was very good that you got your answer in the text, uh, but it was a very important question you put there. And uh, my own view on that, uh, uh, so far as we come into the text, I think language in reality is our friend, but we it's a friend that we've been mistreating. And uh, it leads to grave consequences. 
Uh, I'm not 100% sure of that, but what I am sure is that I agree with Athelt, and I felt that for some time, that the confusion goes way beyond philosophy. Way. We, I mentioned earlier how it goes into physics, the cosmological fallacies, and much more. I won't go into that. Uh, I think it would be greater that we get into that into the next lecture. Uh, why? Thank you very much, Carla, for participating, for your questions and you. comments. Fantastic as usual. Thank you, everyone, for listening in. Have a very pleasant morning, day, or afternoon, wherever you are. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>